Welcome ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ralphie and today we shall talk about the Verpal Mongo's 50 Throttle. For full disclosure, Verpal sent me this item for free in exchange for an honest review. And as you will see later on, I believe I was very fair in my assessment. First off, we will discuss what this throttle brings to the table, its functionality, the ergonomics, and an overall assessment of the system, while comparing it to another product it directly competes with, the Thrustmaster Warthog Throttles. I've spent several weeks playing around with this throttle, mainly in DCS, and I think I've acquired some insight that many of you will find useful, as you judge whether or not to purchase this throttle, which currently sits at $362.39. If you're comparing this to the Thrustmaster Warthog Throttles, you will notice that they currently sit at $269.99 on Amazon. So effectively, the verbal throttles are $100 more than the Thrustmasters. So, let's see if they're worth the deal. Although this is a heavy throttle and weighs similarly to that of the Thrustmaster, it's still lighter than this thing. But not by much. The dimensions are also slightly larger at a length of 9.5 inches and a width of 6.6 .6 inches. It sports a very subtle yet much appreciate metallic chamfer on the edges, which is a nice touch, but the throttles and most of the switches are plastic, much like you'd find on the Thrustmaster. Verpal lists of mechanics being made out of high precision aircraft grade Duralumin, which is effectively an alloy of aluminium, copper, magnesium and manganese. On the button side of things, from the top, you get a lever, which is an axis that sports a gear handle type of grip. This lever is interesting, because I'm sure people will find different ways to utilize it. Although this is an axis, and I'm personally using this lever as my zoom action, I'm certain that some people will use this to cycle their gear instead, as it resembles one anyway. I like it set as zoom because of how tall this lever is, making it easy to manipulate zoom with just my thumb. The verbal software that comes with this will allow you to set some of your axes as buttons. So you could possibly turn this axis into a two-button assignment for gear up and gear down, which is really awesome. In the middle, you get eight basic square buttons. Just below that, you have three two-way momentary switches. And on the side here, there are two more switches with a slightly different type of mechanism that remain in the position that you set them to. Next to that, we have a very nice master arm type of spring mounted red switch cover with another two-way momentary switch. This switch remains in the middle position by default while the red cover is up, but when you move the cover down, it will push and hold the switch in the down position. Below that, we have a single push button and a five-way mode dial, which has fully reprogrammable LEDs as you switch through the different modes through Verpal software. These two are access knobs that have an indentation as you pass through the middle, which is super handy depending on what you map this to. These two access knobs I personally use to increase and decrease the volume of my radios, since simple radio has become the norm in most servers. I find myself adjusting the volumes of my radios constantly while in flight, so this makes my life just a lot easier. Meanwhile, these three knobs are unfortunately not access knobs, but instead, they are infinite rotating encoder switches, which will produce a push button action per click that you can feel as you turn the dial in both directions. These dials also have a push function, which brings the total amount of actions to three per knob. One action to the left, one action to the right, and a third action when pressed. I use these to rotate through my frequencies for my radios. The included push function helps a lot in some modules, like the F18, where I can scroll through the radio presets, and then use the push function as the pull function on the Hornet. The throttle handles themselves are split throttles that can be connected via a spring loader mechanism, which is definitely easier to use than the Thrustmaster's magnetic one. On the side of the right throttle, we can find two four-way hats, a single push action button, and a five-way hat. In the front, we have a single four-way hat, three single push action buttons, and a very welcome scroll wheel on the right throttle. Your plaque can be found in the front of the throttle base with your serial number. Mine is number three. <laughs> the throttles do sport an adjustable idle and afterburner detent. The friction on the throttles can be adjusted via a 5mm key on the side of the throttle. Meanwhile, the idle and afterburn detents can be adjusted from the underside of the throttle here via a 2mm key. If you're going to play around with moving these guidance, please make sure not to over tighten these, as making them tighter will not increase the detent friction. While we're here, it's worthy to note these four screws, which are used to mount to the bracket if you're going to use a desk mount. Okay, so let's talk about the ergonomics of this throttle. I will judge how this throttle feels to me in comparison to the Thrustmaster, starting with the most important section, the grip. Placing my hands on the throttles feels exactly right. The throttles aren't too thick where my fingers have a hard time reaching over the buttons in the rear, and are just wide enough to accommodate my whole hand comfortably. I like the Thrustmaster, which has a rather sizable gap between the throttles like Michael Strahan's teeth. The Mongo's grips sit flush against each other. The grips rock a stylized pattern which ends at the top of the throttles, and then have a sort of rough texture continuing on down. 
and all of this feels very comfortable with the added friction on my palm, as my hands aren't slipping on the grips, like the smooth plastic finish on the Thrustmaster. The thumb buttons on the side of the right throttle are absolutely fine to reach without me having to overexert myself in any way. Although it is worthy to mention that while trying to press this button, my thumb tends to rest on this four-way hat to get over it in order to reach that button. I haven't yet tripped this four-way hat by accident while going for this button, but it is a minor thing to mention regardless. The five-way hat is very easy to manipulate with its design, although I would have personally preferred a slightly different kind over the pyramid style presented here. This hat is already elevated with this platform, so it alleviates any tripping over this four-way hat. Thus having this style for a hat just seems a little overkill to me. Regardless, I found no issues using this five-way hat and am overall pleased with it, which is why I'm using it to slew my sensors around with the Z-axis click being my lock-on button for the radar and the F-18. In the front of the throttles, the three buttons present are comfortably placed in such a way that even my medium-sized hands are able to reach every single button including this weirdly outboard button with my pinky finger. The rotary is a very welcome addition to any throttle grip, although I do wish it had a shorter travel time. Currently, it takes two full swipes with my finger to go from the very extremes of this wheel, where I would have personally preferred a single swipe with my finger for ease of use. It does, however, have a middle indentation, which helps immensely depending on what you map this to. I found that this four-way hat has a bit of a design flaw to it. It works perfectly fine in the vertical as I push it up and down. Unfortunately, due to the horizontal line features, my fingers will simply slide left and right over the hat without actually moving it. This forces me to put my finger on either side of the hat to push it left or right, or alternatively by doing a cobra chokehold on the hat with my finger. It's a slight oversight on Verpal's part, but a noteworthy one. The throttles can obviously be split apart with this little mechanism, and comparing it to the Thrustmaster one, it's vastly easier to operate. I've always had trouble trying to make the throttle grips together or separating them because Thrustmaster must have used neodymium style magnets on their throttles. The Mongoose, on the other hand, has a spring-loaded mechanism, so when you want to join the grips, you simply need to push the lever down and it snap locks in place. Okay, so that's just neat, okay? The travel distance on these throttles are noticeably shorter than the Thrustmasters. I haven't yet made up my mind whether or not this is a good or bad thing, so I think it really falls under one of those it's up to you to figure it out categories. It didn't make my flying any worse, as it was just simply different than what it was used to. Although the throttle can be used on a desk normally, there is also the option of mounting it with one of these VPC desk mounts that go for $44.19 each, which is a bargain when comparing it to the monster clamps that some of you might know about. This is a sturdy piece of equipment that can be adjusted both vertically and laterally. Once attached, there wasn't any real noticeable wobble to the throttle while moving, but that depends on how tightly you screw on the bolts by hand. I would have preferred more rubber padding on these mounts as I already have a noticeable scratch on my desk. For example, there should have been a small pad on this metallic part here. The biggest issue I had with this mount was the way I couldn't comfortably have this mounted to my desk and keep my armrest on my chair. As you can see, it would be impossible to use it this way, as the chair armrest interferes with the height I'd like on my desk mount. At first, I thought this was a rather huge problem, but after seeing pictures of other people's sim pits, it looks like most of these folk have chairs with no armrests to begin with. So, depending on your setup at home, this may or may not be an issue for you. Since I've never used desk mounts before, this could just be something I need to get used to, as this whole time I've been accustomed to only having my stick and throttle on the desk. Thus, your mileage may vary. Well, now it's time to focus a bit on the negative aspects of this throttle. There really isn't much that would be considered a deal breaker, but there are a few things that are noteworthy. The very first thing that struck me as really weird or out of place would be this button right here. I just, I, I just don't get it. Like, why, 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 why? I understand having a button with a safety design so you don't trip over it. But this one just seems so odd and out of place that I can't really overlook mentioning how weird it is. I know I've seen a button like this before in a cockpit, and true enough, I found one on the K50. Still, perhaps I'll repaint this yellow button to something a bit more discreet. Who knows? The empty space to the left of this lever also feels like it could have been utilized better, with at least one or two more switches. Perhaps it's just me, but it feels like a missed opportunity for a tiny bit more functionality. But it's not like this throttle is lacking buttons, so it's not really a big deal. 
Another drawback to this throttle is the lack of a slew sensor. I know that the next iteration will more than likely have one, so that's something to look forward to, but I just can't help not to mention that you will not be getting a slew sensor with this iteration. I personally get around this problem by just using the 5-way hat to do exactly the same thing I would have mapped my slew sensor to, but it just seems like such a standard thing to have on modern throttles these days that it's weird it isn't implemented right away in this iteration. The other thing that a lot of people have commented on is the position of the throttle grips. In comparison to the Thrustmaster, these grips are very far forward. It was a bit weird at first, especially when you use these throttles on your desk, as your arm needs to extend further along the desk than usual. However, after some usage, I got used to it, and it really wasn't as bad as my initial impressions. And this is why initial impression videos are so useless. Lastly, I need to mention my biggest gripe with this throttle, which, again, it is not a deal breaker for me, but it is an annoyance I cannot overlook. And that would be the idle and afterburner detents. I really do love the fact that you can adjust the position of the detents, but the actual indentation feel is not adjustable, and the detents are extremely easy to pass through. While I go from the low RPM setting to mill power, I will almost always trip through the mill detent and hit afterburner. Likewise, I will do the same when trying to only hit idle detent. On my Thrustmaster, I have removed the detent and shaved it down so that I can push my throttle to mill power and hit a very noticeable stop. Then all I have to do is simply apply somewhat significant force to push the throttles past mill into afterburner and bam, you're there. To push the throttles from idle to off, you still hit a complete stop and then you have to lift your throttles and push them back to shut the engines down. Now this makes a lot of sense and has never failed me. So I was quite disappointed not to be able to do something similar on this system. So let's summarize my overall thoughts. I honestly think this throttle offers a lot more in terms of functionality over the Thrustmaster. It has a very solid build to it, it feels just as rugged as its competitor, while delivering you more buttons and rotaries that are essential for binding all of the modules that exist across the western and eastern aircraft that we fly. Sure, the design more closely resembles that of the eastern block of planes, but it works just as well for the western ones. I found it reliable, and more importantly, a pleasure to fly with. Although I may not have paid for it, had I not been a part of this review opportunity, I would have definitely bought this for myself. And this is because I've had the Thrustmaster Warthog for many years now, and it's done me very well, but after so much time, I do recognize its limits. I needed more functionality, and the Thrustmaster just wasn't cutting it anymore. The SciTech family has been too cheap and unreliable, not to mention an ergonomic failure in my honest opinion. There really wasn't anything on the market that could stand up to what the Thrustmaster had to offer at the time. But now, Verpal has entered the game with a superior product. I would highly recommend it, and I give it a fictional score of 8.5 out of 10 Ralphie dudes, considering everything I've said here today. So, well done Verpal. I do hope that you take into account some of the things that I've mentioned as constructive criticism towards your future developments, but I fully acknowledge your work as a true passion to sim flying, and that gives me faith in your company's future. Ladies and gentlemen, that about wraps it up. Be on the lookout for part 2, where we tear down the War BRD and the T-50 stick. And on that note, sayonara and good night.